Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today with the legend of NASA, the voice of NASA, <laughs> Mr. Hugh Harris. How are you doing, sir? Well, I'm not sure that I like being a legend. I think I'd rather be alive. <laughs> well, oh, do you have to die to be a legend? I think so. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. We're Well, we'll call you a national treasure instead, all oh, right? Thank, well, for what kind. you've done, just like our producer, my co-producer and buddy for over two years on 630 episodes of Stay Curious, Marty Mar uh, Winkle there. Hey, Marty, how you doing? Doing good, Mark. Hope you can hear me. Well, Marty, they, they can hear you thanks to Tom and Mark Usiak buying us a new Yeti microphone. Thank you, guys. We're a nonprofit, and yes, we'll take uh, ways that you can help our museum any way we can get it. But uh, so uh, you'll be able to hear Marty's comments and questions a little bit more, and then when we have multiple guests, we can uh, display uh, another microphone up here. But Hugh, great to have you again. I know you've been a little bit under the weather, uh, but uh, uh, glad to have you here at our Stay Curious Studios to talk about a couple, some of the shuttles of. September. We've got some interesting missions this month of the 11 shuttles that were launched. Oh, they're all they're all interesting. And uh, I apologize if I cough. The um, I, I did have COVID for seemed like a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, but theoretically, I'm negative. So let's go. Well, let's go. That's right. And you're well prepared there. Uh, of course, uh, Hugh, over 35 years, was part of the public affairs office, uh, uh, starting out in Cleveland and then coming down here. And uh, though you retire, what, what, what year did you retire officially? Uh, th theoretically in 98. Okay. So, so you've got a good 12 <clears throat> years of shuttles there, uh, the last third of the program that he wasn't involved with, except uh, peripherally. And uh, uh, the meat of your uh, career was the end of the Apollo era through the the, the, the shuttle uh, uh, up to, like you said, you retired in, in 95 mm -hmm. there. Well, yeah, and I was there for some of the Geminis. Mm -hmm, right, right. Yeah, we we got a little picture, a famous picture of Gemini 11 was orbiting Earth in 1966 on this date in history. How about that? Well, I, I, I think Gemini, you know, turned out to be a really good program uh, in, uh, in learning some of the techniques that were necessary uh, when we got to Apollo. Oh, absolutely. Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon doing a historic flight on this date in history. We'll see a picture of that. We wanted to say hi to Maynette Smith. Thank you for watching, Maynette Smith. These are people that commented that they were anxious to watch our program today on our little teaser. Uh, Daniel DeJorn, he's an airline pilot. Brad McKinnon, thank you for watching Stay Curious. We had a whole bunch of Chinese characters there, Marty. Uh, I don't know how to translate that, but somebody in China <laughs> is interested to get some Hugh Harris today. Connie McDaniel, one of our great volunteers, does a lot for us. Hi, Connie. And uh, Tammy Miller and Mike Ronaldo. And Mike Ronaldo was the young fellow that did our audio at our shuttle fest last April, where you were the master yeah. of ceremonies. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, we're going to do it again April 16th. We're negotiating with a big fancy hotel in Cocoa Beach to do Shuttle Fest 2. And we certainly hope that you will be our Master of Ceremonies again. I hope so, and I appreciate it. Well, let's look at a couple pictures of Hugh Harris's past. Uh, who are you there with, Hugh, and what's going on at your, that's your office at the Launch Control Center? Well, not exactly my office. Uh <laughs> That that's in the control room, uh, uh, the firing room, and that's George Diller. That's uh, right beside me. Mm -hmm. uh, and George was very kind uh, in that uh, uh, he invited me to come over uh, and uh, take part in the uh, last launch, and the court the countdown was going on, uh, but we hadn't gotten anything. Uh, you know, very serious or very close to the actual launch. But it was nice to get over there again. And and the the firing room uh, then was so much different than the one that uh, 
we had at the beginning of the program, uh, which of course was a uh, a holdover from uh, uh, the uh, Apollo program. And today, it's really a, sort of a sea of computers, which uh, shows you know the tremendous difference, uh, and also advances because. Uh, getting the information today, uh, you get so much more, and in such a uh, good package that uh, it's uh, it's amazing the advances just in the place where you sit and and try and launch a uh, rocket. Uh, you, we didn't talk in our pre production meeting, so to speak, about uh, Artemis and 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 your take on the. Uh, the, the two scrubs and uh, all that's going out there. Uh, as we look at this uh, uh, blast from the past picture of you on a, on a real telephone, folks, that's what he has in his hands there for you under 30. That's a telephone <laughs> <Yeah>. receiver. <laughs> and uh, I told you if, if you could find them headphones, we could sell those for a couple hundred bucks as well as your badge there at one of our auctions. Well, but uh, give us your Artemis take there, sir. Well, I, I'm not really surprised. Uh, it, it's really hard uh, to safely launch people into space. And, uh, and so it's essential that you get everything right. And um, Artemis uh, is, well, you, using the uh, new SLS uh, for the first time, uh, is going to uh, really be a test of of a lot of technology that really hasn't been used uh, in the same way. And of course, it's the biggest rocket that's ever been built. So, um, you know, so I want them to get it right. Uh, the I think I felt even stronger when we launched the uh, the first space shuttle because that was the only time uh, that I know of that anybody has launched people on something that hasn't been tried in space un uncrewed before. Absolutely, yes. STS-1 with uh, uh, two brave test pilots, John Young and Bob Crippen, of course. Uh, and, and April 12th, 1981 was that launch. Marty, you got some... Uh... Well, yeah, the Artemis is not the biggest. It's the most powerful. Santa V was still bigger. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, yeah that's true. From an Apollo <laughs> guy over there. Uh, and and I'm, I'm with Marty. They're, they're cheating. They got two pop bottle rockets on the side there. That Saturn V rocket was five F1 engines spewing... Uh, you know, fuel uh, out of them there. But uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, basically a, a shuttle on steroids with a, a, a crew cabin on the top instead of on the side of the tank. But Well, I'm anxious to hear what it sounds like uh, because I, I think that it could well be the loudest one we've heard. What do you think, Marty? Yeah, yeah Marty thinks it could be the loudest one too on there. So, And uh, he's our expert. Yeah, yeah, he is. Well, he's seen them all. You've seen most of the Saturn I wouldn't say expert. You I'd say I'm fairly knowledgeable. <laughs> yeah. As a lead, uh, lead electrical engineer, Marty was on the Grumman Lunar Module. Uh, uh, and uh, he was inside every one of those ascent stages and all around it doing his job. And then Marty worked 30 years on the shuttle launch processing system. And I'm glad that you talk about Marty because... People like Marty are the backbone of what makes the space program possible. Well put, Hugh. You and I are reporters. We're sideline people, you know, uh, that uh, uh, witness the history. They made the history. That's right. And on there. So uh, part of history, nice little segue here, is is uh, Hugh wrote a book uh, and... and uh, uh, we're gonna. We've got some copies of this book that Hughes autographed. Uh, you info at americanspacemuseum.org or M A R Q, or message us. Send us twenty dollar bill. All right, and we'll send you this little tome that you wrote about 
Challenger and American Tragedy, the inside story from Launch Control. I read it in one sitting. I couldn't put it down, Hugh. Uh, and it's not really pretty. I mean, you know, we know the tragedy and everything. So well, tell us a little bit about why you wrote this. And uh, 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 Well, as I was saying about Marty, people are the most important uh people uh, well the important thing about life is the, is the people and uh and they're what makes it possible for civilization to advance and uh be better over the years now some people you know seem to try and impede that from time to time but um uh, what I the, I wrote the uh, the Challenger book uh, really after I retired because I didn't have time before it, and uh, so it doesn't have anything new in it uh, as far as the nuts and bolts, uh, but it does talk about how people were uh, thinking and uh, what they were doing during the uh, the period, and. Uh, and how we really recovered uh, without uh, being a technical book. So it's it's really about people, and the um, uh, I'm you know very happy uh, with the outcome. It's it's quite short, yeah. And uh, but all of the copies that you have, as far as I know, for sale, are ones that I uh, autographed. That's right. 20 bucks will get you this tome to you. Speak of your good friend Jay Barbary and, and the scoop that he he got out of there. Well, Jay, Jay was a fantastic reporter, if not uh, a little bit controversial sometimes. But uh, he was uh, sort of the ultimate reporter in that he really he got to know all of the people who were involved and so he didn't just rely on somebody to hand him a, a press release or a press conference the uh, and uh, he made uh, you know very good use of his friendship uh, with people like Sam Bedingfield uh, who I'm sure you're familiar with. A founder of our museum, and, rest and, in peace, uh, Sam Bedingfield. Others too. So he he was able to get uh, the inside story of what was going on sort of as it was happening over a long period of years. And um, he also was friends with many of the astronauts. And um, uh, I think that as far as NASA was concerned, uh, and uh, NASA, by the way, gave it, uh, gave him the highest civilian honor uh, that it has. Mm -hmm. But um, he was, um, uh, he wrote, uh, uh, one of his best books was on uh, Neil Armstrong, mm -hmm. uh, but he wrote about 10 books on the, uh, on the space program. And uh, I, I think gives anybody a uh, a very insightful look at uh, some of the history so the uh, on the other hand he was a a good old southern boy uh, who grew up um, picking cotton mm -hmm. and Talking about uh, Jay Barbary who passed away about about a year and a half ago didn't he two years oh, ago it's, yeah I think yeah. it's longer than that now yeah but um uh, one of the um, uh, stories that I like best about Jay, he was very anxious to get into the Air Force uh, when he was theoretically too young to do that. And um, in, uh, he persuaded his mother that uh, it was time for him to do that. <laughs> and um, uh, he wanted, he took her with him to swear that he was old enough. And um, she said that she was not going to lie about his age uh, to the Air Force uh, recruiters. Uh, but she had him put a piece of paper in his shoe 
and mark on it 16. And so she could honestly say when she talked to the recruiter, he's over 16. <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up being a, uh, a pilot. He, uh, he had a, a very high score on the uh, exam that they give to recruits. And uh, he ended up being an instructor pilot. And uh, one of the things that he was proudest of was the fact that he said he never let a Russian MiG get east of the Mississippi River. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, Jay Barbary, I had the pleasure of meeting him on a couple of occasions. He's helped the museum out over the years. Uh, the scoop he got in your book was the scoop that he got on, oh, on the well, Challenger. Well, that uh, came from... Uh, uh, really uh, uh, from his friendship and uh, with also his uh, ability to, uh, you know, foresee that he was going to need some help and, um, and arrange for that. And I mentioned Sam Bettingfield before, and Sam had just retired, and Jay hired Sam uh, to work for NBC uh, for him. And uh, he said, uh, Sam, I think you're going to be talking to some of your friends out at the center. And so I'm, I'm interested in knowing, you know, what people are thinking about the, uh, the accident. And Sam said, well, I've been meaning to go out there and talk to him. And uh, Sam did indeed go out and uh, talk to people, and he came back and uh, discussed it with Jay. And between the two of them, uh, they decided that uh, uh, that it uh, really was a uh, a problem with the uh, uh, solid rocket booster. And um, however, in order to um, uh, he asked uh, the appropriate people uh, in public affairs if they knew anything about this, <clears throat> and they, of course, did not. But there was a, uh, no, uh, a, a press conference where the center director was out there, and uh, while he was walking back to his car, uh, Jay said, the, th this is what I'm hearing. And the uh, uh, the center director at the time said, "You got it." So he had his story um, hmm. uh, as an exclusive, um, and um, the only problem was that he had a um, uh, a grandson who was a reporter for the Today newspaper, and um, he felt that he really ought to give him a heads up. And his uh, wife um, really thought he ought to give him a heads up too. But um, the, uh, he, he swore, he said that it's okay, I'll give you the story, but you can't use it until I'm on the air tonight on NBC News. And, uh, and that's what happened. Mm. Well, that story's in this book, Challenger, An American Tragedy, the inside <laughs> story from none other than Hugh Harris there. And uh, uh, we can talk about that more down the line, but it's available on Amazon. It's an e-book, you said? Well, it, it was an e-book up until the beginning of this year mm -hmm. when they finally brought it out in paperback. Okay. And the, <clears throat> the cover uh, shows it being launched, and... I think, and, and of course I was there when it was being launched, and it was one of the prettiest launches that there ever was for really? the shuttle, uh, partly because of the birds that were flying around uh, at the time. And uh, for that to have gone wrong, uh, mm. it was just, you know, that wasn't quite right. Cause yeah. It is one of the pictures I can pick out because uh, of the birds have a distinct pattern <clears throat> in all of the photographs you see of it there. So 
Hugh Harris, thank you for sharing that about your friend Jay Barbary. We certainly miss him. He was one of the iconic uh, reporters of the space age. In fact, he saw all human launches uh, up to the uh, Crew Dragon. He was ill to see that one, I believe, the demo. And uh, Hugh and I are going to put together some programs talking about the journalists out there at the Space Center that he dealt with over his 35-year career, from, from the TV guys that you all know, like Walter Cronkite, to the newspaper guys that only you and I know, like Howard Benedict. And uh, uh, and uh, some of the, we're going to do one on the women reporters out there. Well, the women reporters are, are really important, too. And... Uh, Talking uh, about Mary Bubb and... Well, uh, we're, we're going to mention yeah. Mary later. Okay. Uh, as we go through some of the... Uh, uh, this, this space well, let's get shuttles. to that. Let's get to that. As we're getting our space shuttles <coughs> of the month of September up there, uh, and uh, always wonderful when we have people like Hugh Harris on here. Uh, uh, we might get off track a little bit, but you're getting space history from the source, and we hope you all enjoy that on Stay Curious. September shuttles, first African American woman, Mae Jameson, 11 shuttles. Discovery uh, uh, was uh, four. Atlantis three times. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about Discovery and Atlantis flew four times. Endeavor three. And no September launches for Challenger or Orbiter uh, 099 Columbia. And uh, these were uh, uh, really only one satellite uh, mission, the TDRS. Uh, mission, three hard hat missions of the International Space Station, building it, um, uh, five science payloads, uh, and on this date in space history, Hugh, we have 42 astronauts orbiting the Earth in seven space shuttles. Isn't that incredible? Wow. Yeah. And you make it sound like it all happened at exactly the same time. Well, uh, yeah, that would be crazy, <laughs> but juxtaposed over history, we've got on September 12th to 18th, we have eight shuttles in orbit. 42 astronauts can say, I was in orbit that week of September. But four of them were there twice. Mm -hmm. Waltz, Wilcock, Reedy, and, and Lee all were all astronauts that flew twice in this uh, week of September. Uh, and STS-64 and 115 were launched on the 9th. Three shuttles launched on the 12th of the month. Uh, 48, 47, and 51. So I'm going to let Hugh take over here as we talk about STS-69 uh, uh, on there that is known as the dog crew because we talked about that throughout the week. The astronauts actually ate out of dog bowls at their uh, traditional meal up there, some inside joke that the guys were doing there. So tell us about what you researched on that, Hugh. Well, I, I think it's one of the more interesting uh, 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 missions, uh, and but not because, you know, it was so hard and uh, so unusual, <clears throat> but it carried uh, what was called the wake shield. And... Um, the, there that is. And everybody knows that there's a vacuum in space, if uh, which is why the astronauts wear spacesuits, <laughs> because they need to carry their own oxygen and it needs to be... We're right going to see there. another vacuum in space at the end of our show, though, Hugh. Oh, well, I'm glad to... Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> yes, or? I do. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, it, but in any case... Uh, the uh, the wake shield was really, uh, as far as structurally, just a a, a big round, twelve foot uh, diameter circle of stainless steel, and um, you say, why why what do you want to do with that? Well, it turns out, of course, that well space is a vacuum that there's a lot of stuff flying around in space. Uh, we talk about the solar wind and about the particles that come uh, from other bodies uh, within the solar system. And um, so if you, it turns out that if you 
put up something like the wake shield uh, and it goes through the uh, uh, through the theoretical vacuum uh, in the direction that you're flying uh, on the shuttle that what it will do was it will deflect the uh, the various molecules and atoms uh, that are there so that you get an almost perfect vacuum on the uh, the back side of it and uh, the wake shield was used to uh, uh, do experiments on creating uh, much more pure uh, 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 solid state devices uh, and chips um, uh, to uh, to see uh, if you could get you know, great improvements uh, over the way that they function. And um, we, we, the, uh, the launch uh, was actually uh, scheduled for August, so you might have talked about it last month, uh, except that it was postponed because the, uh, uh, there had been uh, some uh, concern about the uh, solid rocket motor nozzles and uh, the uh, fact that little, uh, well, tunnels sort of had opened up um, during launch. And there actually was a lot of things that happened prior to Challenger, which we talked about before, uh, that were sort of the precursor to uh, that, uh, because there's such tremendous forces that are unleashed and such tremendous heat that's unleashed uh, when you ignite a, uh, a solid rocket. And, um, but um, the, the thing that uh, I, what I like about that particular uh, science uh, is uh, that, um, the uh, and and I learned this uh, fairly recently that a lot of the uh, the things that are flying through space are dust that's created uh, when stars explode into supernovas, and uh, it also turns out that uh, this space dust is what. Uh, actually people are mostly made of so that you and Marty for instance are made out of the same material <laughs> uh, as uh oh uh, mute is, Marty's mic there he's he's and, not going to want to hear that <laughs> and uh, I, and then you say well why are there differences like one person's a marine and the other's not <laughs> and uh and that has nothing to do with the space dust because <laughs> uh, women and men are both created uh, out of space dust along with other, uh, 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 other creatures. Uh, and um, we, uh, the, although I had not heard about this before, I heard about it uh, in a sort of roundabout way. Uh, because the, um, and uh, we were talking uh, earlier about somebody being a drummer. Well, it turns out that the drummer for the rock band Queen, uh, whose name was uh, uh, May, uh, decided that he was going to quit the band and go back to college and get his uh, doctorate in astrophysics mm -hmm. that'd be brian may yes. lead, lead guitarist actually for queen right yeah yeah and, brian uh, may. also he was involved in some of their big hits uh like uh we are the champions oh yeah absolutely and, uh, everybody knows brian may and um the uh his uh, dissertation is doctoral dissertation and we're talking years ago as you uh -huh. know uh, was about what happens uh, when you have uh, supernova 
and the creation of space dust. And uh, also the fact that that is the building blocks of, uh, of people and other life forms. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, uh, and it, that has, uh, you know, been uh, confirmed by other scientists. Uh, uh, so I, I tend to believe that uh, that's the case. Well, that's some, some, I love astronomy. You know that, Hugh. And uh, well, anytime we're talking stardust and... and uh, well, just one more thing, which yeah. is sort of a, a nerdy type thought. Uh, it turns out that uh, part of, the, uh, of what is flying through space coming from stars is hydrogen. And both you and Marty are nine and a half percent hydrogen. Okay. And, but that begs the question, if you have a weird sense of humor, is that if somebody is bigger than another person, they, even, they have the same percentage of hydrogen. Hydrogen, uh, as you know, uh, is lighter than air and was used in balloons for flight and that sort of thing. So if larger people have more hydrogen, <laughs> why don't they weigh less than smaller people? Oh, there you go. That is interesting. Well, paradox. It, it's there. it's a weird thought, actually. It, it is a weird <laughs> thought. Uh, well, we're talking with Hugh Harris, voice of NASA. Millions of people heard him do the countdown to, to lift off. Marty, we've got a question. Yes, from uh, Ben Hurst. <clears throat> I'm assuming he went online, but he says, our store says you have sold out of Mr. Harris's signed books. Do you plan on getting some more? I'm going to go out there and check. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. We supposedly had a, a few copies of it. Marty's going to check on that, Ben. Uh, while uh, uh, I'm going to take that Wakefield off here, we're going to talk about 86 in a minute. But, Hugh, uh, talk to us. And we want to wish Terry White a speedy recovery. Terry, the uh, orbital processing facility manager uh, out there, had uh, some uh, non life threatening uh hospital stay there and i talked to him today and he's doing well and Good. and maybe he'll be back at the last week to do uh the shuttle garage with terry white terry glad that everything's nominal in your operation and recovery there uh but hugh we, we were talking on the phone when i was checking up on you one day uh that you were flown to berlin to an air show and boy uh, uh kind of interesting what the hell did you well, do? So talk about that. <laughs> uh, when was that? Do you remember what year that was? Oh, unfortunately, I don't. The nineties uh, or eighties? Uh, it was the. It was after the Berlin Wall came down. All right, well, that'd be nine, late nineties. And oh. the. It was the first uh, uh, international air show, that was held in Berlin after the wall uh, fell. Okay. And um, so I flew you over there across the pond with your wife. Right. And it was it, it was sort of unsatisfactory. Uh, I mean, it was great to go. It was great to see what was happening because I had been to uh, Berlin while the wall was up and had gone over uh, and the uh, the the Russians uh, only really allowed you to go and look at their monuments over there. But anyway, so finally I was going to see a free Berlin, and the only thing they had me go, uh, go there for was to count backwards from 10 to 0 to start the air show. And uh, while I was greatly honored to be asked to do that, uh, I, I certainly would have uh, liked to have done more. <laughs> A 10 second appearance to do the countdown. That, that's right. And uh, by, uh, that's, well, uh, that's, you got to give it to them that they recognize, you know, that uh, you were uh, uh, famous for doing that over here in America. Uh, you're the only one that they would want. So that's a cool anecdote from you, Hugh Harris. Flown to Berlin, 
to do a 10 second countdown. Did well, you do it in English or German? No, I, I had to do it in English. In English, I offered to do it in German. To open the air but, show. But, but everybody else was speaking German, so I guess they didn't. <laughs> and uh, one of the, um, the things that I had not heard of before I got there was about uh, the, the great sort of celebration that they have uh, both for Father's Day uh, and uh, a, a culinary one. Hmm. Uh, for Father's Day, there are all a lot of men out riding bicycles with bundles of, um, of plants on their handlebars, and apparently it was a a, a, a common uh, a thing that everybody did on Father's Day. But the uh, uh, walking down the street, I kept seeing signs at restaurants about vice espargo. And um, the, that's white asparagus. And I didn't realize that they had sort of a huge celebration when white asparagus was available at uh, uh, to eat and uh, and dozens and dozens of restaurants featured it all right but we'll get a white asparagus restaurant uh, uh, menu <coughs> recipe from somebody probably here you interesting marty what about uh, hugh's book here in our museum for yeah Bay? we have sold out you so it's up to you to get us some more books okay but I had to give you those. Yeah, <laughs> we'll buy the rest of them. Yeah. Good. Uh, I got a question also. Okay, from Marty. Mark Yusiak. You did you have a favorite shuttle launch director you worked with during your stay with? We stay in the firing room. Oh uh, well, the uh, all of the launch directors uh, were unique, and um, the. Uh, and, and I don't know of any that uh, I didn't like. So I can't really say that uh, there was one that uh, was my favorite, especially since most of them were alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, okay. Well, that would be Mr. Jim Harrington and Mike Leinbach, of course. You, you were there for a lot of launches of the 57 that Bob Seek launch or 53 launch well and don't don't story. forget george page george page was your first uh, first one there of course and uh al o'hara uh, uh and then gene thomas can't forget gene and uh dave king. Uh, uh pardon me dave king dave king yep, yep there you go dave king and ralph rowe there there you go yeah. with all the launch directors there don't know much about dave king except I think he took over Marshall or Hunt. Uh, he he uh, did move uh, Huntsville. to Huntsville. Uh, yeah, to Huntsville. And Ralph Rowe is. Uh, don't know much about Ralph either, but. Uh, well, George, George Page was the first one. Yes. And uh, he was a uh, a very disciplined uh, director, and um, the he, I don't think really thought that anybody on public affairs, let alone somebody who was going to talk while they were trying to launch should be in the firing room. So he had a protective uh, panel put up beside me so that I, I wouldn't bother uh, other people. Huh. Yeah, not unfamiliar with that. The media sometimes uh, uh, isn't people's best friends or they, they 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 don't you know think they can control you marty another question yeah robert law is asking you do you remember john holloman of cnn oh yes no i i remember uh john very well the um yeah that uh if if i'm thinking of the right person i think i am um the, he passed away really very prematurely, and um, but um, uh, he was um, he did a a great job, uh, and uh, and of course we had another uh, really fine uh, person from CNN, 
uh, in Zarella. John Zarella. Yep. There you go. Yep. We'll have to get you down at Zarella's one day. I'll pick you up and we'll go have a meal down there with John. Okay. Uh, it's become the hangout for the space rocket hobos that go out there mm. and photograph the launches like like the UCAC brothers and uh, Carlton Bailey. And, uh, yeah, he John loves the whole court down there. We hope to get you on Stay Curious here, John. I got a, a effort that with him. But, yes, his son, Mike, uh, got a fabulous uh, restaurant there. Uh, you would Have you been there? Oh, Zero? yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, very uh, early. Uh, I haven't uh, been there recently. Right, right across the street from Zachary's, another famous well, restaurant. Well, that's right, yes. Yeah, in there. Well, we're enjoying a conversation with Mr. Hugh Harris here. Uh, we're going to talk next about STS-86. Well, that was a mirror mission. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can say, you know, mirror. Uh, yeah, peace, <laughs> the Russian space station. Uh, and um, uh, put put a put a extra vehicular activity up there at the Mir space station because you've got a story about that with one of the astronauts that went up on eighty six. The um, well, it 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 just shows that uh, uh, being an astronaut does not necessarily mean that you can do whatever you want because. Um, the in the case of um, Wendy Lawrence, uh, and it, it, we have a picture. There. Yeah, we got a picture of Wendy here with the crew uh, in on the Mir <clears throat> space station. Wendy's right there beside me. Well, she was uh, supposed to do uh, EVAs there, and it turns out that uh, she was too small to fit into the Russian spacesuit, and so. Uh, I think it was David Wolf uh, had to take her place on um, on uh, the mirror for that. Right up above uh, David Wolf there in the middle with the big smile. Can you imagine that, folks? Training for your uh, a five month stay on the on the Mir space station. You, she'd have been the second woman to be there, mm -hmm. of course, behind um, um, oh the the uh, Marty, who's the woman on. Mir and very seasoned astronaut, uh, senior moment here. Uh, she'd been the second woman up there, and uh, uh, because she was so small, oh, Shannon, uh, yeah, Shannon Lucid, yes, thank yeah. you, yes, yeah, Shannon Lucid. See, your memory's as good as mine, all right. Uh, well, uh, so David Wolf took her place mm -hmm. up there, yeah, and uh, here's the crew up there. Uh, you wanted to add a little bit to that, I think, that um. Uh, a full, full uh, David uh, 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 Wolf was dropped off, and uh, yeah, full was the last one up there, I think. On right. there. So this was the seventh docking with the mirror. They had two more after this, and and uh, Wendy went back up on ninety one. She was up there on eighty six and ninety one, two two mm -hmm. mirror missions for her up there. And here she is looking at the uh, at the landing, and we put that in there because uh, you had a little story about uh, the tiles. Well, there uh, the landing of that mission um, uh, turned out to have resulted in uh, quite a lot of um, uh, damage. Not enough damage to you know just uh, to destroy the. Um, a thermal protection system, but uh, the when they got back, uh, they discovered that the uh, orbiter had uh, quite a lot of hits on the uh, the bottom of it, and um, the uh, that was one of the precursors uh, to uh, a, a lot of work that had to be done. Uh, to try and figure out how to, uh, because they thought most of it was uh, from um, uh, debris from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, the insulation on the uh, on the tank and the ET, <laughs> the external tank there, and uh, and of course that uh, you know was a, a you know a very serious problem that. Uh, 
could have uh, destroyed the uh, uh, the orbiter. And you hear about this, folks, that, you know, constantly foam coming off the ET, mm -hmm. which uh, the skin of it's almost 400 <laughs> below zero for the hydrogen chilled in there. And then you put like a, 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 a foam insulation over it. Uh, and we found, uh, Hugh and I uh, a little bit ago found this graphic. Marty, I don't know if you ever saw this before. This is the 99 space shuttles in a 20-year period. The, all of the accumulated hits on the underside of our shuttles, the first uh, 99 of them, all right? And I forget the time frame uh, uh, was, um, I think it goes from about STS-26 uh, up to uh, well, 99 shuttles up to that. So it's about 112, something like that. Uh, what an incredible illustration of all of the accumulated hits. Uh, on the shuttle, uh, uh, put on one underbelly there. And, um, you know, uh, there's even some a detail there on the right, right there, oops, uh, where it's showing uh, uh, the uh, hit on one, uh, uh, 117, I mean 107, where the uh, wing was compromised mm -hmm. when we lost that crew. But uh, uh, pretty interesting, 15,000 hits and counting, all right? Uh, when this graphic was put together in 2009, I believe, on there. What do you think about that, Marty? Amazing. I never would have thought that much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, I, I'm kind of amazed, too. And all of it at the, at the bottom there, you know, uh, underneath the, the engines there is just kind of interesting, the concentration there. So, you know, what that tells and, me, Hugh, is the durability of this spaceship, though, too. Well, yes, and it, it also, though, is... Uh, illustrative of the uh, of what designers were saying uh, originally uh, there were there was uh, quite a, uh, a strong push uh, to make the uh, orbiter differently uh, of, a, of a different material uh, that would uh, you know stand the uh, the heat uh, but uh, was a, a metallic uh, so that it wouldn't be bothered by uh, uh, any sort of uh, uh, debris hitting it. And um, But the problem of flying in space is always weight. And uh, so the, the type of uh, thermal protection system uh, was a compromise uh, between uh, you know, having uh, something that was, uh, you know, sure to uh, survive uh, uh, things like that and, uh, and having, uh, being able to lift very heavy uh, uh, payloads. And uh, the, the shuttle was, a, you know, was an interesting uh, uh, program and in, in showing sort of what's essential if you're going to build large structures in space because you can't build them on the ground of the size that you might need in space and then launch them whole. Uh, they have to be put together up there and they either uh, can be put together with, uh, uh, you know, having many, many launches of small parts or uh, then not quite that many launches of bigger uh, uh, structures. Yeah, well, quite fascinating there, the things we can dig up, and particularly when we have folks <laughs> like you here on Stay Curious, Hugh. A comment, Marty? Yeah, they saying he's asking to you to post that picture on Facebook. Oh, okay. okay, that, that might, might be an interesting picture. Okay, Dave, we'll do that. We'll. Uh, uh, as long as I don't get in trouble with the copyright, I'll have to double check that on there, which I do, but sometimes uh, things will, will bite you that you, you try to find out. Hugh, did you want to talk about a couple other shuttles there? We, uh, uh, we had the Japanese uh, go up with the first African-American, Mae Jameson, on STS-47 30 years ago. We've highlighted that. Um, another mirror mission. Of course, return to flight was 26. Well, we might 
go back to 47 because uh, yeah. one, one of the things that the press found uh, interesting with 47, which had nothing to do with the, the uh, mission or the uh, experiments, was that that was the only time that we flew a married couple and in the press conference... Mark Lee and Jan Davis, yes. And in the press conference, uh, of course, one of the uh, reporters asked if there were going to be any, uh, uh, you know, sexual uh, things happening uh, between the two of them. Somebody really asked that, right? Oh, absolutely. And if I had to guess... I would say it was Mary Bubb who asked that, but I and I and I'm sorry, Mary, if I'm uh, got the wrong person. But Mary asked that question actually uh, of more than one crew. Uh, uh, Mary was a uh, a great reporter, and uh, we'll talk about her uh, more. But she was one of the uh, the first uh, women reporters. Uh, who covered the uh, space program exclusively. And uh, she actually worked for the company uh, that, uh, uh, now I've forgotten the name of it, uh, but was best known for their publications on women's clothing. Uh, but uh, Women's Wear Daily? It, it might Maybe. have been that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then uh, she went to, I think, Fairchild. Anyway, eventually they, uh, uh, that ended up being her, uh, her only interest. And uh, she did a, uh, a great job. And uh, uh, there's all sorts of stories that uh, one can talk about. Her. Yeah, we want Mary Bubb, a B-U-B-B. -B. And uh, what was her signature look? Well, her signature look was wearing a different hat for every launch. And uh, and some of them were pretty weird. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, but she, she was a fun person and a very hard worker. Yeah, we sold some. She passed away. We sold some of her things in an auction, and she had uh, uh, some, some interesting artifacts there, too. Uh, but, uh, but what was the answer to that question about if Mark Lee and Jan Davis were going to have uh, sexual relations in space? Well, uh, Jan reassured the uh, reporter, whoever it was, uh, that no, that was not going to happen. In fact, we're going to talk with Mikey Haddad about that mission because it had the Japanese Space Lab mm -hmm. J for Japan on there. Yeah. Uh, with uh, uh, astronaut Morai, and uh, we're going to talk with Mikey about that payload, Mikey Haddad, on the, uh, the 28th of September, uh, and uh, I'm anxious to hear him talk about that, but they had the red team and blue team or something like that. They had two 12-hour shifts, and the husband well, and wife were yeah, separated that, during that That, that, that was very common, uh, not to separate husbands and wives, but to have 12-hour shifts in red and blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, the commander uh, was allowed to usually move between one or the other team, uh, as far as depending on the work hmm. that was going on during that period. That's an interesting footnote. The commander could go on either team. Interesting. Cool. Well, Hugh, we've enjoyed talking to you about these shuttles. Did you want to highlight another one before we go into a little space history to end? Stay curious. Uh, we got some cool space history for you here coming up. Well, the um, I can't think of anything at the moment that. Uh, well, let's look at let's look at what we talked about earlier <coughs> uh, on this date in space history. Why have I got turtles on our show here? Because and Hugh knows this because he lived it. Uh, uh, I lived as a teenager. Moon race drama in 1968 as uh, the Soviets blasted. Uh, a Zond 5 spacecraft with living creatures, uh, two tortoises, uh, some fruit flies. Uh, they took uh, wheat cells, peas, carrots up there to test cosmic radiation, and it looped around the moon 
All right. Uh, just three months before Apollo 8 was scheduled to launch to orbit the moon. So the conjecture was on this, this uh, uh, circumlunar flight that was a success was that uh, uh, the propaganda machine fueled the, the fact that they would have a, uh, a, a person on board uh, for a circle for orbit the moon before December. Uh, they thought they might do it in November. So it gave an illusion that Russians were ahead of the space race. The Soviet propaganda machine fueled the speculation, mm -hmm. Hugh, by playing a joke on the broadcasting loop through Zon 5 of having cosmonauts talking about landing on the moon. And you know who picked up that transmission was uh, uh, Sir Bernard Lovell at the Jodrell mm. Uh, Bank Observatory yeah. in uh, uh, the United Kingdom. You remember that? that? Oh yeah, they. Well, Jodrell was a a, a great source of uh, information for everybody on uh, what was happening in space. Actually, tapping into Soviet conversations yep. and so forth with one of the most powerful radio telescopes at the time. They made it back alive. The tortoises uh, flew to the uh, around the moon and back and. Uh, uh, that was uh they originally wanted to fly two cosmonauts but they had launch failures all right uh of their zon three and four and this was zon five and then the moon rocket the n1 moon rocket mm. uh that never uh, flew right and that was the demise of the russian moon race well and i think that uh, again people are the most important uh part of the whole equation and uh, when that rocket exploded, uh, their chief designer and many other scientists, uh, well, when I say many, I'm not sure how many, uh, Dozens, were, though. Yes. were were killed uh, because they were there looking or right next to the rocket. Mm. And by the way, to you talking about animals and uh, living things, and uh, one of the... Uh, uh, flights in um, September, and I've forgotten now which one it is, uh, had a the very first um, uh, Israeli uh, experiment which involved hornets. Really? And whether the hornets uh, could build uh, uh, their, their standard sort of nests in space and could uh, hatch and multiply and that sort of thing. Uh, and it turned out that uh, uh, they could not work very well in space. So don't take a hornet Don't take space. a hornet. We don't have to worry about <laughs> bees having a nest somewhere right. on there. I'll look up what that is. Another bit of space history, you mentioned Gemini. Uh, yesterday was the spacewalk of Dick Gordon, and Pete Conrad was photographing this as Dick Gordon, uh, when a, the Gina rocket and the Gemini spacecraft dock, he went out and rode it like a, a horse out there. And uh, I was thinking Good that might be him. a very uh, famous picture that was requested from your office. Well, or, it, it, it might have been, but at the, that time, I, I was in the headquarters building and not out at the press site, so mm -hmm. anymore. Well, we want to remember, we've been talking about that all week. Uh, as you know, our Space View Park celebrates the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts with their mm -hmm. handprints out there. Yep. So we got two birthdays today. Happy 72nd birthday to Dr. Eugene Trin. He is the born in Saigon, South Vietnam. Parents moved to Paris, France when he was four, when he was two years old. Then he came to the United States when he was 18, became an American citizen, and he was on microgravity lab one, STS-50. Happy birthday to you. And uh, we also have, uh, we're going to talk a minute about uh, John Harrington, born in Wetumpka, Oklahoma. Uh, at, at, he is a Chickasaw heritage, uh, in, a Native American, all right? Uh, there he is with the governor of the Chickasaw Nation presenting the flag that he uh, took with him to space. And though he only had one mission, uh, John Harrington um, uh, did a spacewalk, all right? 
uh, at the International Space Station. He wrote a children's book called Mission to Space. And he's going to be speaking out at the Space Center in October. Maybe we can get him on Stay Curious. He's a good friend of Triple T, Travis Thompson, our closeout crew lead. Uh, in fact, he did Triple T a big favor when he uh, uh, Travis was in Houston. His mom was, was uh, 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 ill uh, with cancer, and he gave Harrington gave uh, Triple T the keys to his apartment. Yeah. Uh, so he had a place to stay while he was taking great. care of his mom. Yeah. And uh, also the dollar coin that none of us got in 2019, because then they no one wanted to handle coins after COVID. <laughs> the dollar Sacagawea uh, commemorative coin features his spacewalk on the back of that. So mm-hmm. what, a, what a cool uh, a guy, John Harrington. Um, he... Uh, 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 we'll, we'll hopefully talk more about him here in person there. But uh, he actually flunked out of college, folks, okay, and then uh, got involved in the space uh, uh, with NASA. Yeah, Marty, a comment. Yeah, from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Carlton Valley. When talking about reporters that made a difference, you can't forget Sue Butler, Anathan, and her husband, Jerry. Oh, abs- absolutely not. And... Um... And we'll we'll be talking about uh, them later, but uh, Sue Butler uh, was particularly interested, uh, interesting from the standpoint uh, she was born into the Austrian nobility, and um, hmm. the uh, when Hitler uh, started sending troops into Austria, uh, she was sent to. Uh, uh, Poland, and um, from there, uh, she was able to get on uh, uh, escape uh, with the um, organization, and I forget the uh, the name of it now, uh, that was uh, taking refugees out of, uh, well, uh, primarily, I think, Jewish refugees uh, out, of, uh, out of Poland and away from... Uh, uh, the uh, you know being sent to concentration camps mm-hmm. uh, and uh, to England, where because of her um, abilities, uh, she is, they had two choices: one, they could be sent to to uh, a university, or they could go work on farms, and. Uh, because of her ability, uh, she was sent to a university, and she ended up um, working for, uh, and I forgot the agency, but for the American um, uh, uh, organization where she was parachuting into France and other countries and helping save uh, Americans who uh, had either been captured or had uh, had to uh, uh, parachute from their planes when hmm. they were being shot down. Well, thank you for that question, Carlton. Uh, and finally, here on Stay Curious, a little uh, uh, flash in the past uh, that was posted on Facebook uh, from our friend Nicole <laughs> Dot. Uh, this is when she went up on 128 in uh, August of 2009, but in September, uh, uh, on this date in space history, this September 14th, she posted this picture saying that she did the first vacuuming in space on the space station with this vacuum cleaner. All right. And uh, there's Nikki doing that uh, on this uh, uh, in 1909 uh, uh, on there. As Marty hands me the, uh, some of our people watching there. So, you you know, we've got some cool artifacts here in our American Space Museum. And I commented to our collection manager, Nick Enix, that we've got the, the prototype of this Boeing vacuum cleaner. I told you there was yeah, another that's, vacuum that's amazing. In, in, in the yes. show in here. <laughs> uh, so uh, there it is in our display case. Uh, I, know, uh, I know Larry Pusker has seen that. Uh, Mark Usiak seen it. We'll say hi to Carol Cavanaugh. And there's Larry Pusker there and Tom Usiak's watching. 
And uh, thank you guys for the microphone that we can hear Marty on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, Andy, Andy Oliva. I know Andy's watching. Robert sure. Law is up there in Spanish. Uh, Olivia, yeah, Oliva, <laughs> Oliva, Andy Oliva. He's a local guy here. And Ben Hewson, we saw from him. Say hi to some of them people there. If you, <laughs> the, um, oh, we show you another picture. Well, Christina Greer and Cynthia Ressi, um, William uh, Whiting, uh, Melissa Pope. Uh, d yeah, d uh, Denny. Denny No. And Christopher Ma Mick. Uh, Mick. He's, he's in Wisconsin. Daniel uh, DeJong. Uh, Cliff Watson. Pomona, Australia is where Cliff Watson is. Oh, how's well, everything on uh, uh, Thursday there? Well, I'm I'm uh, I, I used to talk to people in Australia all the time, uh, for so, but only in the middle of the night uh, because I used to get calls from bars, <laughs> uh, you know, with people at bars in Australia asking to settle. Uh, a, a difference of opinion or a bet has to. Did you hear that, Cliff? That Did you ever call happening? Hugh, the voice of NASA, wanting to uh, settle a bet? Pro probably <laughs> not. Uh, Jeff uh, uh, Siebert, Siebert uh, Patricia Williams. Hi, Patricia. She does a podcast. It's a good one. And Ben Scarborough. Yeah, there you go. Enjoying. Mr. Hugh Harris on here. Wanted to just show you that uh, I mentioned this to our collection manager, back to the the, the, the vacuum cleaner. There's a manual for that. <coughs> Crew Systems Equipment Workbook there, Hugh, from July 87. Mm -hmm. Has everything you need to know about this thing in there. All right, there there it is, uh, a close up. Uh, and there it is in the manual uh, that Nicole Stott obviously read to figure out how to, to use it. Uh, not much to figure out. Somebody on her post asked, what did they do with the dust? Was well, collected and gotten away as, as usual there. And uh, so so fun to share uh, Nicole Stott's moment in time in 2009. And uh, she's got a great book called Back to Earth. It's filled with her experiences as they relate to the global climate crisis that we have on and how she learned how serious it is. And she came up with some Stottisms, we call them. And one of my favorite ones is live like a crew, not like passengers on our planet Earth. Very wise. Yes. We got to help each other mm -hmm. save our environment and so forth. And there's Nikki's book there. Hope that if you haven't read it, uh, let you uh, 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 go out and buy it. And uh, we hope to have her for at our Shuttle Fest 2 that we're putting together uh, right now in the middle of April. So uh, thank you, Nicole Stott, for all that you do to uh, promote not only uh, the environment uh, of Earth, but also promote art. She's mm -hmm. the first person to do watercolors in space. And she has a foundation space art uh, for healing and uh, 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 as well as inspire the next generation out there. So Hugh Harris, can't thank you enough for having a great show here. We know it was kind of a long one, but that's what we love to do. And we have have uh, uh, national treasures. We'll call you like yourself <laughs> yeah. on here, sir. So uh, everybody, Marty, thank you for doing such a good job today. Any further comments from you? Nope, we're good. Well, I, I think it's nice that people can hear Marty's voice now. That's right. I, it, it saves a lot on me trying to interpret right. <laughs> and hear him with my my bad hearing here. So and he'll agree with that. So, Hugh, you have Very any final well, comment for everybody out there watching you today? Well, I, I, I appreciate your watching and being interested. Uh, the space program is about everybody. And uh, so... I'm glad you're here. And we look forward to having you back for the shuttles of Rocktober, as I call it, the month of mm. October. So, uh, well, good job, Marty. Thank you, Trekkie Techie Jessica Galloway, for 
helping us at the last minute, making sure we have everything right on two microphones on there. And we did. And and we did. And and uh, and so, Hugh, thank you very much for another wonderful program that I'm sure people enjoyed. And on behalf of Mr. Hugh Harris, I'm Mark Marquette, saying that I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. <laughs>